Thank you. Thanks for that, Nathan. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks so much for our sponsors for tonight. Um, hope to definitely take you up on pizza and beer next time we, we have a chance to do this in person. Um, and thank you all for making time to join us tonight. And um, please try to stay dry and stay warm while we're going through the presentation. So let me just introduce myself and I'll introduce a little bit of the topic. And uh, as Nathan mentioned, um, I've got a presentation prepared here, but I want to keep it interactive, so please do send your questions along as we go. I'll try to address as many of them as I can. Um, I've got a second screen set up over just to the side here where I'm trying to uh, monitor the Slack channel as much as possible as well, but it may not be possible for me to do that, so I'll, I'll rely on Nathan to kind of surface those questions as we go. Um, so my name is Jeremy. I'm the VP of Business Development with a company called uh, Divi Cloud. And uh, Divi Cloud is about a four-year-old company. We focus on making cloud automation for large-scale enterprise cloud environments. And uh, what that really means is we work with large-scale enterprise adopters of cloud computing platforms, typically companies that are running thousands or tens of thousands of virtual machines across their cloud environments. And one of the things that um, you know, we wanted to share tonight is this approach of DevOps with guardrails. And this is something that we've really learned with those customers over the last couple of years. Um, and then the last thing, just to try to uh, remove any confusion as we go, is that Bot Factory is the name of our software. Um, so Divi Cloud is the company, Bot Factory is the platform. Um, and so you'll hear me referring most typically to Bot Factory, um, where I do talk about our product specifically outside of, let's say, the purview of the general presentation. So DevOps with guardrails, what does it mean? What's it all about? One of the things that we've really learned in talking to these customers is that the way that they adopt cloud is, um, is typically does have some aspect of strategy when they start the cloud adoption journey as an enterprise, but that may change over time. And it's that change and it's really that actual behavior as they go that becomes really interesting and really challenging for them as organizations. Um, and the reason that cloud, by the way, is so important, I don't think it really bears too much uh, discussion here, is that cloud really is the agile infrastructure environment that pairs so well with the agile application environment that these DevOps teams are, DevOps teams are looking for. So this is where we really see that overlap, and this is where we really see the challenges as they go. A lot of these organizations are used to operating in a typical IT model where they've got central design, where they've got central control, and where at most the IT organization may be exposing solutions to users, potentially through something like a central portal or a service catalog. Um, but when they go that approach, they're relying on their IT organization to really serve the infrastructure needs of all the different apartments or all the different application teams across the company. When they go this route, they know that they've got security and policy built into their infrastructure layer, and they know that they've got some level of assurance around, let's say, um, compliance with different factors that they need to be aware of, whether that is budgetary compliance um, and so cost control around their infrastructure, bearing in mind that cloud infrastructure is almost always pay as you go. Something like an actual compliance regime that they need to um, be aware of. So very common example that we like to cite and that we've seen time and again with our customers is those customers who operate in the healthcare space have requirements around um, making sure that they're only storing data within the US um, for data sovereignty and governance purposes. Cloud platforms that they work with very often include regions all around the world, and so it's it's not uncommon to see customers make um, accidental mistakes where they'll deploy something into a non-US region. And you know where they've got this central IT in place, they can be pretty sure that they're not going to run into these problems. So these are their concerns when they go into that, uh, you know, where they go down that path of adopting cloud platforms. In a number of different approaches that they've tried. Um, and just to kind of go through them, and I won't spend too much time on this, we've seen the service catalog, we've seen the central provisioning portal, we've seen companies that try to grant console access but with certain restrictions, um, and we've seen companies that try to create you know, more genericized deployment templates that maybe define the infrastructure environment and allow application teams to build on top of these pre-approved templates. Um, we've also seen the approach of what we call the golden AMI, which uh, um, for those of you not familiar with Amazon Web Services, an AMI, you can think of like a server template. 
So it's a virtual machine definition. It's got an operating system and maybe a certain number of packages pre-installed or a certain number of configurations uh, predetermined. And uh, we've also seen customers who really just try to lift and shift and use cloud the same way that they're using traditional infrastructure. And we've seen customers who, who go with a ticketing route. And you can see here some of the reasons, but fundamentally the main reasons that these approaches often don't work at any kind of scale is that simply put, there's too much demand for infrastructure and there's too much variability in that demand um, for this, this kind of centralized model to really keep pace with what the business or, or what the organization requires. The only one where we've seen any level of success is really the golden AMI, AMI approach. And even that only works because it's kind of a unit driven approach for the virtual machine on its own. And in those cases where we've seen it work at the scale of thousands or tens of thousands of virtual machines, the customers have developed a very sophisticated process for creating those AMIs and for then sharing them across the organization to ensure that different, um, you know, different application teams are using them. So just to try to illustrate in a little bit more detail why that approach doesn't work, um, does anybody remember Sesame Street and remember this game that used to, uh, you know, there would be a little song playing over the top of it? And the, the song, in case you don't remember, was, you know, one of these kids is doing his own thing. One of these kids isn't quite the same. Well, this is where these type of centralized approaches start to typically break. Um, you might have five different teams within an organization, and they might be using different technologies. They might be using different approaches. And just as a simple example of that, let's just take the example of an intranet. Right, so an internal website where we're sharing information within the company, um, you've got a couple different options. You've got a media wiki as one option, you've got SharePoint as another option. But if we just peel back the layers for a second and we think about what the technology platforms are underneath them, for media wiki, we've got you know, a Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP stack, so the you know, classic LAMP stack. Most often, it's a scripted installation process. I can have a media wiki instance up and running in under two minutes. You know, from start to finish. Um, whereas SharePoint, you know, is a Windows platform, uses Microsoft SQL Server on the back end. Um, we've got an interactive wizard that we click through to install the software. Very much a GUI and user interface driven process. Again, about um, the context of an organization or a large scale enterprise, you end up with um, you end up with many different teams having different application needs. Um, and the, oh, sorry, along with those application needs, you see things like different technology stacks. You see things like different cycles for how frequently they get updated. Um, you know, a lot of open source projects actually get updated and get new releases much more frequently than commercial software from, you know, from large enterprise software vendors. So set of requirements is really where the centralized models, you know, that's really where they ultimately fall flat on their face at some point. They might work for a while, they might work in limited scope, um, but at full enterprise scale and with really the strategic desire to take advantage of all of the flexibility and agility that cloud platforms can offer them, um, they just don't work. So how do our customers that we've observed, how do they actually go to the cloud? Well, one thing that we've seen time and again is that ultimately decentralization is the rule. Decentralization is the way that they will, um, you know, they'll kind of do that classic approach where IT gets out of the way and people can get access to what they need and get their jobs done much more quickly and more efficiently. So we see decentralization, we see self-service downside to this. And that downside is that once you have multiple organizations within the company creating uh, infrastructure along with their applications, you lose this standardization, you lose this centralized control, you may lose both visibility as well as kind of security overview. And so what you see there is that very often you have DevOps teams that are moving very fast, releasing on a you know daily or twice a day cycle or, or whatever it may be. And as they're going, um, they'll sometimes make changes to try to troubleshoot a problem with an application. So application component A can't communicate with application component B in our latest deployment. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to peel back the access control list between them and enable those uh, and make sure that there's not you know, a network configuration problem that's preventing those two pieces from communicating with each other. 
So it's really this cycle that we see playing out time and again as they go deeper and deeper into the cloud, more decentralization, more self-service, all of those things are good, but that brings with it the downside of having more risk and a little bit less control and less standardization on their cloud environments. So, so ultimately what does work? Well, one of the things that we've observed, the customers who are most successful in leveraging cloud platforms are the ones who really go um, kind of as deep as possible into the, what I will call here, the release, whoops, the release the hounds mode. Um, and so that's really, you know, let your teams go straight to the infrastructure, let them do what they need to do. Uh, of course, that's scary for a lot of people within the organization, especially those tasked with compliance, tasked with security, tasked with, um, you know, auditability across their environments. And so that's where we see this idea of having guardrails in place being very, um, you know, very reassuring to those parts of the organization. So it gives them the peace of mind to know that they can allow their teams to go forward and, and move quickly and get what they need, you know, get IT out of the way. But they've got, again, this these assurances that, you know, safe from any real large scale disaster, or at least um, they can put in place controls to mitigate any of the risks. So that's the focus. That's the idea of guardrails for your DevOps environments or, or DevOps with guardrails. And I'm going to get into um, a lot more examples about you know how this plays out and talk a little bit about how we've seen um, you know how we've seen customers approach this. Um, before I do, let me pause for a second. Nathan, any questions that have bubbled up so far? Uh, no, none none yet so far, Jeremy. Uh, I have confirmed with everyone that the stream is going well, though. Excellent. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, cool. So with that, let me just uh, proceed. So let's pause for a second and let's talk about um, one quick thing about the cloud that I want to kind of you know just address and, and think about for a second. And that is, um, there's a common misconception that cloud is always cheaper, um, and that really the value of cloud is is the 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 cost savings around it. What we have found at um, larger scale is that this is not actually the main value driver behind cloud platforms, but that, but that the main value driver behind cloud platforms is agility. And, and if we think about that for a second, this again goes back to what I mentioned at the beginning, which is why is cloud so perfectly aligned with DevOps? And the agility factor on cloud is, again, cloud is pay as you go, pay for what you use, but no commitment. If what I have on my infrastructure is not what I need going forward, I can simply tear it down, throw it away, and create something new. So if I've started life with, or I've started this application's life with four servers of a certain size, and what I realize I really need is eight servers of a smaller size, um, then I can do that. I can throw away those four servers, I can get eight new ones, um, and I can do all of that in the matter of a couple of minutes. And so if you think about the changing needs of your application as new features get rolled into the application, you know, you may add a new audit feature and that may, um, that may dramatically drive up your, your requirements for disk read writes because you're now auditing every action taken inside the application and you may now have a, you know, high IO requirement along with additional storage for the database layer. With cloud, you really get that agility. All right, so let's talk DevOps. And I'm not gonna go into the, let's say the conceptual DevOps part of this in any kind of detail because um, I think I'm talking to a DevOps audience and you guys know this 10 times better than I do. I'm primarily a cloud guy. Um, so I'm coming at this from the lessons that we've learned in working with a lot of the cloud teams that partner with the DevOps teams at our customers' organizations. Okay, so Probably some of you have seen this picture before. It's not mine. I stole it from a company called Clogeny. Um, if anybody knows anybody over at Clogeny, thank them very much for creating this image. It saved me an awful lot of time. Um, so you can see here, you know, really a DevOps pipeline that's, that's detailed in maybe a level of detail that's even higher than a lot of you might think about it in your own DevOps processes. Um, I think I counted something like 11 unique steps and something like 35 uh, unique products when I, I counted on this slide. And this is really designed to be um, kind of an ideal CI CD process, um, you know, operated by a DevOps team. And you can see, you know, from the point that the code is checked in 
through the point that it is live within the production environment here. There's a number of automated steps, um, you know, smoke test, control test, packaging, deployment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our friends at Chef um, highlighted here on the slide as well. Um, so this is really kind of start to finish a, a very detailed process to give people an idea about what a DevOps pipeline might look like. Um, like I said, a lot of the DevOps teams that we work with have much more simpler pipelines um, for their own deployment purposes. To just kind of show you what, what we've seen. Let's take this into um, a more simpled, uh, a more simplified um, process. So this process came from one of our customers. And what you can see here is I've got three applications that are going live. Um, and combination of infrastructure all in orange and application all in black. So we were talking to this customer and we started digging in on a lot of the, uh, on three of their applications and what is the process. And we found that this is a smaller organization around about a thousand employees around the world. Um, but within three teams all sitting in the same location, they had three unique um, DevOps processes. And on the left hand side, and, and go through this bit by bit to try to explain what they had going on. So from the infrastructure layer, they start with a CloudFormation template that defines the infrastructure environment. So um, again, in case you're not familiar with Amazon Web Services, I'll try to break this down in, in layman's terms. Um, this is basically finds um, what the infrastructure should, should look like. So as an example, it's going to say, spin up two application servers, put them behind a load balancer, connect them to this database server on the back end, and put two unique network segments around them with open ports so that the application tier can communicate with the database tier. So that's the infrastructure de definition coming from the CloudFormation template that they've got. Now, within that CloudFormation template, the application servers launch off of a base server image. So I've got a server template with an, uh, an operating system pre-installed. Inside my uh, operating system image, so inside this AMI, I've got a boot script. It is going to run a set of configuration options when the server comes online, and it's going to reach out to an external environment and pull the latest version of the, of the, or the latest approved version of the code down from the source code repository. At the same time, my network has been stood up. So now I've got these uh, unique network segments to contain my database server and my application servers. And the last step is to check my application servers in behind my load balancer. My load balancer is going to perform a health check on the application servers once that code has been pulled down. My load balancer will communicate with those application servers, verify that the application is up and running, and then it will start accepting uh, client traffic from the outside. So in this kind of combination of you know, three kind of unique steps that break down into two steps at each step along the way. So kind of six unique, I guess, or, or really six unique steps. Um, we've gone from zero to having a deployed application in a cloud environment. So that's one example for one application. And you can see here two other applications by two other teams in the same office location had slightly different uh, methodologies. They all uh, were running on AWS. They all used, um, you know, VPC technology but they had different um, deployment tools that they used for, for different purposes. So a lot of variation that you see on different environments. Um, and we're going to come back to this a little bit later on in the presentation. So one other thing that we've noticed in working with um, customers at, at you know, kind of the large scale that I mentioned was that very often their approach to fixing problems goes along with this idea of automated deployments. And so, when you've gone through the trouble of, of uh, building out an application environment um, and you've got some issues with it, what we've very often seen is they tear down the entire environment. Um, and you know, for the teams that are very sophisticated and, and forward thinking, they've got an automated um, pullback or an automated um, rollback. Uh, that's the word I was looking for, excuse me. They've got an automated rollback for their deployments and they can simply go back one version. They can simply um, you know, take the environment down, what have you fix the code, and then deploy it again. Um, but for those teams that are not quite as sophisticated, um, we very often see this approach have it causing downtimes as well. So I've deployed my application. I found some bug. I found some configuration problem, what have you. 
might need to take the entire application down, um, you know, fix something in the code, and then redeploy, um, and and you know have some associated downtime along with that. What we've seen from the cloud infrastructure side is that there is a way that you can um, you know put some different controls in place for um, you know for keeping that. Uh, or, or, or for avoiding this approach being the necessary approach and avoiding the downtimes that might be associated with it. I do want to pause for one second, though, and take um, take a little bit of a sidebar in the IT perception of DevOps, specifically as it relates to security. So, um, again, I realize I'm talking to a DevOps crowd here tonight, so I'll give you fair warning that you may not like the next slide. Um, some of you may have seen it before, but this is the perception that we've seen at a number of organizations where you've got a, a large-scale enterprise cloud adoption that is being facilitated by a central IT team. Decentralization and self-service is the order of the day. There is still kind of a tension that often um, emerges between the IT teams and the DevOps teams that are creating infrastructure. And the perception is that DevOps is perceived as kind of this um, magical unicorn that that poops rainbows and, uh, for lack of a better word, craps all over security concerns. And um, a lot of the times that's because the cultural mandate or the directional mandate coming out of the organization is, um, is that, you know, the DevOps teams are the teams that are empowered to move very fast and the ones that are kind of um, allocated a lot of deference in how they're able to go about doing their jobs and, you know, out of the way, um, and so we've seen a number of different um, number of different customers run into problems where their DevOps teams are deploying, and again, kind of losing sight over what the company's central security policies or security requirements might be um, in their cloud infrastructure. So um, I want to talk about cloud security for a second to try to you know if, if that wasn't clear to try to maybe shed some light on how that kind of problem can happen. Um, cloud infrastructure and cloud security is is a pretty complex thing. So when you consider for a second that the cloud is 100% software defined, and again that you are um, talking about environments where there is all this decentralization, there's so many things that the teams need to be aware of. The basic shared responsibility model of cloud computing. Now, I took this from AWS, but effectively every cloud provider out there has copied this model. Um, so what you can see at the bottom is what the cloud provider is responsible for. And effectively, it is the security of the cloud. So you can think of that as, as the security of the physical data centers, um, you know, biometric access to the, to the actual buildings, um, and then the security of the virtualization layer. Um, but that's kind of where they stop. Whereas you, the customer, are responsible for the security in the cloud. So that's everything from your network configuration to, let's say, your server-side encryption, your file protection, permissions that you apply to things, um, up through your, your operating system, up through your application layer, and of course, all data that you store within your cloud environments. So there's a lot of opportunity for, um, for misconfigurations. There's a lot of opportunity for, um, let's say, confusion or for not being completely aware of what all the requirements of the organization might be more detail, I, uh, I just copied this um, from a, a standard AWS solutions um, uh, architecture slide. And um, I just want to go through, you know, there's at least 13 different uh, configuration options, all of which have some kind of security implication on them. Um, so starting from the outermost layer, you've got an, a load balancer here that has permissions around session stickiness, around authentication requirements. You've got a DNS layer that is um, potentially vulnerable to um, you know, DNS wildcard attacks of different types and has to be configured properly. You've got a, an SSL on the uh, load balancer. Um, you've got identity and access management policies around communicating with external services like an outbound email service or a notification service. Along with that service, you've got key rotation requirements. Um, and then getting into the network layer, You've got route tables that, that need to be configured properly in order to route traffic between the different tiers of the application. Um, you've got subnets that have controls around them, as well as the access control lists. Um, so you've got a communication 
between the application and the database, not only from the network, but from the authentication standpoint. I've got um, permissions on all of my static assets. Um, I've got SSH keys for logging into any of these servers if I ever need to. And finally, I've got a distribution policy for any of those assets if I need to um, use a CDN to distribute them around the world, um, not only in terms of those assets, but potentially things like signed URLs or the communication of the assets from the static repository out to the CDN. So that was just a very brief, and I know I went through that kind of quickly, but a very brief overview of some um, security configuration options that is kind of customers to get wrong or to you know potentially make small mistakes on as they're building up cloud environments. And again, take that, put that set of requirements out to all the different teams that are creating applications and creating infrastructure across the organization. And it's not hard to see why um, customers do end up with cloud configuration or cloud security problems across environments, particularly with a lot of decentralization and a lot of application deployment being done um, you know, by various teams. That is uh, that is kind of you know the background on on the problem, and so um, I'll get into a little bit of a demo. But let me pause it here again for one more second and just check in if if there was any questions that have popped up in the meantime, Nathan. Yeah, Jeremy. So far, everyone seems yeah, to be doing so pretty well. Uh, the only question is, can we have a link to the presentation? And so I told uh, I told the asker that uh, when we're done, I'm sure you'd be happy to show the slides, and we can get them posted. I'll be posting them on our website, and I'll share a link in the Slack channel after the presentation. So no, no worries at all there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Cool. And then uh, I will just say out loud, uh, for those that aren't following along in the Slack, if the slides appear a little bit fuzzy on YouTube, if you click on the little gear icon, you can actually ramp up the uh, resolution of what's what you're viewing, and that will help clear them up as well. All right, Jeremy, back to you. Excellent. All right. Let's bring that last set of um, that last cloud architecture set of, of configuration and security requirements back to the enterprise context. So typically, what we see with uh, enterprises that they'll have a combination of global policies as well as organizational policies. So global policies might be things like, hey, again, you know, we're a HIPAA company. We're never allowed to store data outside the U.S. Um, an organizational policy might be something like, hey, we run uh, only you know, Ubuntu Linux 16.04 with the following kernel hardening configuration applied to it. Um, and if you apply that back to the DevOps example of the uh, customer that, that I mentioned, you, know, you can think that environment one might be production, and it might have a set of requirements like no SSH access at all, all EBS volumes or storage volumes must be encrypted, and CloudTrail has to be turned on. Whereas in the test dev environment um, for the second application, you might have a set of policies that say, we must have SSH open from our corporate network. Um, we don't run any ACLs on our VPC, so no security group screening. And um, everything in this environment lives a maximum of 30 days. Um, that is, by the way, a pretty common approach that we're seeing um, to test and development environments is automatically destroying them after a certain period of time. And that forces a lot of the teams to um, make sure that they're always testing against the latest version. Um, so it actually aligns very, very well with the, uh, with the DevOps approach of kind of moving you know, always forward with your application and always um, kind of getting the latest into testing as quickly as possible. And then finally, um, you know, you might have a back office application that has a very different set of requirements. So here in this case, I just picked a couple examples. So the database here might be serving multiple applications, so it needs to be open from the corporate network, um, but it needs to route over a direct connection, which is kind of, you can think of as a leased line between your office and AWS. I mean, it might have very strict um, identity and access management policies to ensure that um, you know only people who are really allowed uh, are are able to access the environments. Great. So yeah, so that's a little bit of the enterprise context for what those controls might look like. So a lot of the approach that we advocate and that we do see customers going for is um, to put in place these policies as much as possible first, and then to start distributing access across the organization. And what that allows them to do is that allows them to make sure that they've always got visibility and they've always got policy in place, 
And then they can decide what the remediation should be for any problems that get created across their environments. So, um, yeah, so just to try to understand, you know, how would you as an organization go about enforcing that? So the number one thing is to uh, visibility across the uh, across the environments at all times. Um, and so the found to do that is through discovery. Um, we have seen customers try to go with a, a number of different approaches, such as using agents on all servers. And that, that approach generally works until somebody forgets to install the agent. Um, and so what we've seen is that almost every cloud out there, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft Azure, Google, et cetera, provides a way for you to issue any number of kind of inventory calls. And those inventory calls allow you to go through environments and bring back um, you know, very complete lists of everything that you have running. And then you can kind of normalize that data and bring it together in one place. Um, but cloud environments are, um, they're agile, they change very fast. We have customers that have on the order of 200,000 changes per hour in their cloud environments. So you need to be not only discovering once, repeating that process on a very regular basis, looking for changes in the environment. And when you have changes happening, then you can, um, then you hit one of those guardrails and you, you perform a logical evaluation. So simple example of this, again, just going back to our HIPAA example, new server came online, we bring it into the data, we register that as a change, and with that change, we go and we take action against it. And so one of the guardrails there might be, hey, uh, new server came online, it's, uh, is it running in the US? Oh no, it's running in the Ireland region of AWS. Let's take action and let's automatically you know, delete that virtual machine. Um, so that's the example of what a guardrail might look like. And it's important to understand that this is something that has to be kind of running all the time in the background in order to protect um, the organization from any of these risks. All right. So with that said, um, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of a demo. And uh, as I get set up here, um, let me know if there's any questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of continue to move forward. Jeremy, what I see right now in the Slack is lots of people uh, praying that the demo gods are good to you. <laughs> Thank you all for your good karma. Um, we're going to hope so. And um, I have run this demo once or twice, so hopefully um, takes on it. So no, don't get me wrong, I'm not, not trying to be overconfident, but hopefully this will, uh, this will generally work. Live streaming, live demos, what could possibly go wrong? Look, I hate so. All right, cool. So here I've created um, a small environment uh, in, in AWS. I've created a couple of virtual machines in one particular part, uh, one particular zone of the world. And what I've done, and I'll, I'll show it to you in just a moment here when this loads, is I've gone ahead and I've applied a set of tags to, uh, to each of these servers. Um, here I've got a name of DevOps on each of these virtual machines. And um, in the background, I've created a virtual resource group over here. And what this group is designed to do is it's designed to find anything that has a tag value of production DevOps. So here you'll notice that I've got a mistake here. I've mistagged these things with name DevOps instead of production DevOps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and fix this over here. Do that, I'm going to turn on all of my other guardrails. And so this will kind of. All right, so those are going to be running in the background. I'm going to choose all of these, and I'm going to production DevOps on all of my virtual machines. And while we're going through the demo, we're going to check back in on this in a couple minutes. And um, well, we should see this group get populated with those virtual machines, whereas right now it just has some storage volumes in it. So at the same time, we've got a number of other different controls that we've put in place. So just some simple examples of what these are. Um, environments, we want to make sure that we never have any firewall ports open in the 20 range. And so the way that we've done this, and I'll walk through, you know, this is obviously our product, but there's other products out on the market that take similar approaches to a lot of things, a lot of these, um, let's say, controls or policies that you might want to put in place. So I've got a set of rules that says on any inbound traffic on security group, which is a virtual firewall, 
I'm going to be checking for all of these ports. And you can see here, I've actually extended this beyond just the 20s, but I'll, I'll just, for demo purposes, bring it down to all the 20s, so port 21, 22, 23. Um, for those of you who are network people, FTP, SSH, Telnet, and then to the 20s for the heck of it. Um, if I've got open traffic from source network 0.0, .0 so that's anywhere in the world, on any of my production DevOps things, I do. So we are going to mark it as non-compliant. So that's just going to create a report for us. And then we're going to send a little Slack notification. We, we're going to do the DevOps DC meetup, meetup hangout, for the heck of it. Um, and we're going to send a message that tells us that, hey, we've got a really big problem. And we can even send uh, some information about the problem. And then why not? Let's actually go ahead and delete that rule immediately. So somebody accidentally uh, you know, opened one of these ports as part of their deployment. We're going to catch that. We're going to kill it. And we're going to run this whenever something new is created or when something is updated. So if somebody created a new environment or they updated an existing environment with one of these problem, uh, problems uh, situations that we just walked through. So I'm going to go ahead and save this off. And you'll notice it's actually um, paused. That's by design. Um, we have found that, in general, in working with these customers, um, before anybody takes, uh, or, or a, sorry, before anybody deploys an automation that can be potentially destructive, like this one, uh, they want to be able to, you know, do a san quick sanity check on it. So I could actually click on it, look through, you know, the configuration that I built, and so on. I'm going to set it as high severity. I'm going to just go ahead and uh, and let that run. If I have configured it well, bang, 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 I should have gotten some Slack notifications. Here we go. So we can see Bot Factory DevOps DC Meetup Hangout, little channel notification in Slack about the risk, or, or sorry, about the problem. So we've got a 0, 0.0 on ports 21, 22, 23, right? So we found these problem conditions that we were looking for. and um, if we look at our firewall over here, sure enough, we've got a open port 22 on a firewall tagged as production DevOps, right? So we can create multiple different copies or multiple different policies all targeted at those different, uh, different um, application environments. So if we come back here and we think about this example of three different applications being stood up by three different parts of the enterprise, we can put in place one set of guardrails for this production environment, one set for test dev, another set for back office, and, uh, and, and we can continue to go from there. So this is just one simple example of the guardrails that we've put in place. But if I go back into um, my listing environment, and let me just search again for um, some of these things, you'll see that we've got a number of other different ones that we've got. And we can really kind of you know give these a lot of different flavor that we might want to. So this one, as an example, designed to look for um, storage volumes that are not in use. So we shouldn't ever have empty storage volumes. But if we come over here, we'll notice that we've got two of them. And what we've done is we've created a little bit of a workflow. OK, so this one I misconfigured. So here's my live demo gods. Um, but of all things, if they were going to get me on this one, that's not too terrible. Um, we, so we found the two volumes. And if we want to, we can just quickly go in, you know, create a snapshot or delete them. And what I misconfigured was automating those actions. Um, so that's shame on me for not, uh, not double checking my configuration on that one. And we can look at any number of different um, controls. And so just to kind of wrap up on controls that we do see as being common ones, you know, it's things like making sure you're running in the right locations, making sure we just went through that firewall example, making sure our tagging um, structure is, is what we want it to be. And tagging is actually something that probably bears a whole uh, longer conversation of its own for those of you who are deep into the cloud infrastructure side. Um, tagging is hyper important, super, super critical for, for um, being successful with your cloud environments. Um, but you might also have you know, policies around not uh, orphaning those, those storage volumes, like I said, and not storing data over zero days old. So those would be you know, kind of common guardrails that you might see in place uh, for different environments as they get built out. 
Cool. Um, so just at a high level, kind of coming back to what these guardrails are typically used for, we looked at some specifics, but if we back up a second and we think about, you know, tell me about the real, so if I'm talking to somebody in the C-suite and he's asking me, you know, what are these guardrails going to do for us as an organization? Primarily, they're going to do three things. They're going to improve our security. They're going to control our costs. And they're going to make sure that we're compliant with standards. And those standards might be organizational standards, so organizational rules of our own. Or um, they might be standards that we as an organization have for legal reasons, like we are you know, HIPAA or FISMA or PCI, um, you know, subject to PCI audit and compliance, um, whatever those things may be. You know, just going a little bit deeper on these three categories of common problems, you'll see people doing things like scheduling their, their virtual machines to start and stop outside of, of business hours, cleaning up their orphans, enforcing data retention policies, um, auditing their firewalls and their network ports, um, auditing their user accounts for you know, key rotation, password policy, multi-factor, um, checking permissions on their data storage, uh, and checking encryption levels on their data at rest. And then again, on that standard and compliance bucket, it's, it's our tagging, it's where we're running, it's what we're running. So are we only running, you know, maybe we, we have rules that say we only run a certain type of virtual machine, a certain uh, AMI or a certain virtual machine image, those, all of those types of things. And it's important to understand just kind of as a uh, last step that very important for a lot of the enterprise customers is the ability to have a very broad range of rules because different environments will have different requirements. And then also, of course, to make those rules extensible as much as possible. So um, all of the platforms that we've seen having any success in this space go into, the, go into this with very much an approach of integrating into the enterprise rather than trying to uh, force enterprises to change the way that they're doing all of their, um, let's say, all of their cloud interactions to go with, let's say, the platform's approach rather than what makes sense for different application teams. Um, yeah, sorry. So I, I probably should have said that uh, as I delivered this slide. So the point is integration, uh, again, is very um, important. And you can see, you know, as an example here, we did a quick Slack integration for notifications around a problem environment that admittedly I set up for demo purposes. All right. So I think, uh, you know, that's more or less it for my presentation. Um, hopefully, you know, the, uh, hopefully this was valuable for you and giving you some thought around, you know, how the infrastructure um, and things like security risks or, or, or cost um, infrastructure layer might be valuable to keep in mind as you guys are going around uh, and doing your daily work, um, deploying applications. If you're interested in learning more about us, post these in the Slack channel and I'll post a link to the uh, slide deck, of course, uh, in the Slack channel as well. And um, you know, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, here's some contact information, but you can always just contact me, Jeremy, at divicloud.com. We'll bring my presentation to a close. Thank you all very much. And uh, 